Hello, Logging Heads viewers. Uh, my name is Dr. Rob Farley from the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. And with me today uh, is my uh, co-blogger at Information Dissemination, Brian McGrath. Uh, Brian, why don't you introduce yourself? I will. Thanks, Rob, and uh, happy Thanksgiving. Um, my name is Brian McGrath. I am a former naval officer. I am a current defense strategist in Washington, D.C., and a co-blogger with Rob Farley on Information Dissemination. Um, so you and I, uh, and unfortunately we don't do enough of this on blogging, on, at least on this particular blogging this show, but you and I were on different sides of this election. I think you had a much more active role um, on in the Romney campaign than I did for Obama. But, but um, I was certainly surprised, um, and I suspect, although I don't know, I mean, if you weren't surprised, then we should talk about that too. I was surprised at the extent to which the Navy and naval power became an issue during the election, um, to the extent that both sides, especially the Romney campaign, but I think very much in response, the uh, sort of in a, in a responsive way that the Obama campaign talked about, especially four size, number of ships, and so forth. Um, I mean, so I guess starting from there, you know, were you surprised by how much we talked about the Navy? Um, you know, do, do you think that this is going to mean that in the future we, we talk about naval affairs and elections? Uh, I mean, I guess what were your thoughts about how the Navy played out during the campaign? Well, I I think that there, there were actually two phases. There was the phase of the campaign through the primaries and up until around the 1st of October in which I and, and, and uh, several others uh, worked very hard uh, to ensure that, the, that candidate Romney had the latest information on the Navy and, and uh, our plans and our strategies and how, how we might go forward and also those sorts of things. But we toiled it relative, um, it was kind of an echo chamber. I mean, I think Romney talked about the Navy quite a bit. He was part of his stump, stump speech talking about how the Navy was um, uh, smaller than it needed to be, and, and uh, um, but there really wasn't much of a response from the other side, um, uh, and so I, th no, I, I honestly thought it was going to be a non-issue in the in the campaign until the one moment in the debate in which it sort of blew up, and, and from there on out, it seemed like it was an issue. Right now, was there any during the primary part of it? And it's hard for me to recollect. I mean, I'm sure. Well, at least I'm sure there were differences of opinion in, for example, the Ron Paul camp. Um, but did any of that actually play out in any sort of substantive way during the primary? Did, did anybody challenge candidate Romney during the primaries? No, no not, a bit, not, not a bit. Not a bit. There system. wasn't a, um, with the exception of the, the, the Ron Paul uh, folks um, who have a, a pretty principled objection to a lot of what we do um, around the world. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was just. Just was not a big deal. And I will tell you, I didn't expect it to be a big deal in the um, in the general election. I thought we would just continue to uh, sort of toil quietly behind the scenes and hopefully win, and then start putting our stuff into action. But it sort of blew up, and that was fun. Right. I mean, the the, the first time I remember, because I know that the the size of the navy was part of was part of the stump. Um, speech for a while. The first time I can remember the Democrats really being responsive in some sense was not the third foreign policy debate, but there was, I mean, Ryan mentioned it during the VP debate, didn't he? Did, did Biden try to recollect now events that happened only a few weeks ago? And it's really sort of depressing. Um, did Biden push back at all during the vice presidential debate? Because I guess in my mind, that sort of prefigured how the, uh, the, the, uh, the question was talked about in the in, um, in the third presidential debate, the foreign policy debate. Do you recollect that at all? Um, I don't believe that uh, that Biden bit, uh, and I, I honestly don't think it's uh, the, the the only peep I really heard out of the um, Obama campaign uh, on this issue was um, through surrogates, um, mostly uh, Secretary Danzig, who uh, obviously ably represents. Um, the, President Obama on these issues, but uh, I don't think uh, uh, Biden didn't bite. It, it, I mean, it really is kind of. I mean, those of us who deal in this, um, 
like to think that it's something that the American people spend a lot of time considering, but I think that's uh, probably not the case. I think we spend a lot of time in our echo chamber thinking about it, and uh, and, and we just uh, we got bottled lightning this time, and so we got to actually talk about right. it. Um, right, and uh, you know, there was also an electoral logic or on the rough, or on the uh, sort of an electoral college logic on the wrong side, we're talking about it too, right? Um, and that was the question of Virginia's electoral votes, right? There was the expectation, or at least the possibility, that talking about additional shipbuilding, additional funding of the Navy, um, might help them on the campaign in Virginia. Certainly, uh, you know, certainly. I think um, uh, the uh, if you remember the VMI speech that was just a couple of weeks before the election, he. Um, he uh, debuted the notion of a third SSN, that we would build three SSNs a year, um, which is a 50% increase in the number of SSNs we build. The law of small numbers, it sounds impressive, but it's still just small numbers. Um, uh, that was an important uh, that was an important policy goal, something we, we wanted to do from the standpoint of we think we need to do it, but it had the added electoral um, benefit of, of uh, playing, playing well in Virginia, theoretically. Right. Well, you also had, and, you know, we shouldn't forget this part, too, because I thought that this was just, you know, the announcement of uh, Paul Ryan as the vice presidential nominee was just a brilliant piece of political theater um, coming on the battleship Wisconsin, right, um, in Virginia, but they're, you know, invoking Wisconsin and sort of, um, and maybe, I mean, you and I were probably really attuned to this because we were thinking about the naval aspects of the campaign. Um, but that was really, I thought that that was fabulous, fabulous theater, given, giving the announcement. And I, maybe that's because I, I had actually visited the Wisconsin like a week and a half before um, the announcement was made. What was interesting is, um, to, to me, um, in the week or so before that event, we were particularly busy with policy papers and, go, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of stuff being fed into the machine. And that's kind of what we do. We're basically a... We're the guys in engineering shoveling coal into the machine. We have no idea where the ship's going. Um, uh, but what was interesting to me was when I when I heard when I got the news that uh, Mitt Romney was going to do a defense policy speech on the battleship um, Wisconsin. I guess it's it's in Norfolk. Uh, I immediately my 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 uh, bad idea. Uh, Antenna uh, started the twitch, and I, I wrote uh, I wrote a relatively impassioned, um, ultimately wrong uh, analysis. I said, "Hey, we got to remember um, uh, the other governor from uh, Massachusetts and his tank ride, and the pictures that came out of that. Um, you know, that's a that's a that's a museum. It's a dinosaur. It's not a picture of future naval power. It's not. You know, are we?" Is this a bad idea? And I and I, I basically said, yeah, it was a bad idea. Um, no one listened, and they uh, in, announced Paul Ryan and what I thought was a very, very well done. Uh, so uh, it's I should stay out of politics. I think is what I posed it. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, well, yeah, and, and I was I, I was extremely impressed by it, and you know I think that um, I mean they're just you know I mean I think in part just because of different perceptions of, of how. The parties are differently perceived in terms of their relationship with military power. Um, there wasn't sort of the, the almost comic image of Michael Dukakis in his helmet standing, right. right? I mean, you should, we should also add that, you know, archaic or no, a battleship is a far more sort of majestic and visually, um, visually impressive uh, piece of machinery than, um, yeah. and I'm sure people in the Army will disagree, but uh, it added a certain to the. Um, no, it seemed to work, uh, but I, you know, first of all, I didn't think it was going to be a vice presidential uh, uh, announcement. I woke up that morning and Catherine looked at her iPad and said, oh my goodness, look at this, Paul Ryan's going to be vice president. And I was like, really? Uh, and then uh, the announcement was, you know, an hour later. And, and so it caught, they did a good job keeping those of us on the outer electron rings in the dark about these things. And so I just, I just assumed it was going to be a policy speech. Right. Now, did you make the immediate Wisconsin-Wisconsin connection? I did not. I did not. I mean, I, I first of all, I was overcome with joy. I thought that Paul Ryan was a great, a great choice. I, I thought it was um, more of a gamble than than I thought candidate Romney would hazard, and I was very happy with it. 
Um, so I, 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 I missed that whole Wisconsin, Wisconsin thing. Until, you know, until people in the media brought it up. Um, so I was, I want to take this conversation in two directions. Yes. Um, sort of one, one sort of less substantive in some sense and one more substantive, but I want to do the less substantive first. I mean, I, I do want to have a substantive conversation about, you know, the actual arguments over force sizing yeah. that came up during the campaign and what that's going to matter and how, how that'll matter for, um, and we've talked about this before, but how that'll matter for the future of U.S. defense yeah. policy. Um, but I also want to talk about sort of how the last couple weeks, and I guess it would, would be almost the last month of the campaign played out, um, but where that last foreign policy debate, I think, is part of this, where you, you began to have just extremely divergent expectations about how the election was going to go um, on the Republican and Democratic sides. Um, and we've, we've had experiences like this before. If you go back to 2004, there were divergent expectations about how well John Kerry was going to do, although I'm not sure they were quite as divergent as this time. Um, but you know, in the foreign policy debate, it was very interesting to me that in the immediate aftermath of that, partisans on both sides and even in reference to, to the, the interchange that really interests us, which is the elite size, 1917, and the horses and bayonets um, response that Obama gave, um, the reactions, the partisan reactions to that seemed to diverge extraordinarily, just in terms of interpretation of who won that exchange, right? And I know that on my side, you know, Democrats wanted to play that over and over again. Um, in terms of you know saying you know it's clear that our, our candidate had a fabulous counterpunch set up here and that he had a devastating um, it was a devastating rejoinder. Um, I guess, how do I phrase this? Um, well, first, how how did you view that exchange? Right, I mean, when you saw that exchange, you know, did, did fear grip your Republican heart, or did um, you say, wow, I mean, Obama really demonstrated he has no substance on this issue? No, I think um, I, I believe the, uh, that the president landed a very um, square blow with that. Uh, I remember sitting in my chair behind me here watching the debate, and I just lowered my head and shook my head. Um, and I will tell you, it's because I guess the debate was on a Tuesday night. On the Friday evening beforehand, I was driving down to Richmond to my brother's house, and I got a call. Uh, that said, hey, we need you to write something, you know, a first draft of something that will go on the Romney campaign blog um, that explains why numbers matter in, in very understandable language for the average American to read. And so I got to Richmond. I told my brother, hey, I can't hang for a little while. And I, I, got, I, I wrote a first draft out that... Um, Secretary Lehman ultimately uh, tailored and personalized uh, for his own use, posted it. Um, if you go, <laughs> if it's still on the web, <clears throat> I remember thinking immediately after the president landed that roundhouse, uh, thinking, oh my God, I wish Mitt Romney had just read that blog entry, because then he would have been able to respond. Um, but I think he, he was... Um, I think he was obviously not in a pitched battle mode that night. Uh, I think the president landed a square blow. I was I was dejected. Now the uh, you know the the um, the asymmetry that you talk about here um, came to play in the you know the the next that night and the next day as I would talk to my uh, echo chamber friends. It, it would be like, oh my God, that's not going to play well in, in Norfolk and Campton Roads. He just basically equated ships with, you know, um, with, with bayonets. Um, I think there was some, you know, telling ourselves what we wanted to hear there. I thought it was a funny, devastating uh, blow, and I and I just hung my head and thought that was not good for us. Right. I mean, I, I mean, I, I obviously I share that interpretation. Um, I mean, I, I was kind of curious about because it had seemed to me that. Romney just sort of, I, mean, how, I, I couldn't understand why Governor Romney didn't have a rejoinder. I mean, how you couldn't expect that the president would have been prepared, right? I mean, given how much Romney had telegraphed the, the sort of the 1917 talking point. Um, 
you know, I'm sure the president had had been with John Kerry, and John Kerry had done that a dozen times um, to the president, you know, allowing him to hone that kind of response. And it was very surprising to me that 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 Romney didn't have didn't have a better appreciation of what. Yeah, I don't. I, I can't. I can't speak to it. I mean, I I spent uh, you know a good solid 14 months of my life um, working this stuff. Uh, set up a lot. Sent a lot of. Uh, a lot of defenses of fleet size in various ways, shapes, and forms up the, up the pole. Um, but I can't speak, I mean, I think there was political strategy at work in that debate that I, frankly, either don't understand or am not qualified to understand. But um, I think that candidate Romney thought that there was no, there was no profit in counter-counter-punching. And so he didn't. Um, just a little, just a touch more on the expectations. I mean, I guess if you're comfortable, um, what did you expect? I mean, we've heard <clears throat> we we have the very first round of campaign postmortems, right? The, the, there is going to be a second round, and going to be a third round. Um, you know, on Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, election day, what was your feeling about how things were going? Um, if, if you ask anyone close to me. Um, I would say up until around October 20th, I continued to hew to the line of it's difficult to eject a seated president, that this president has a very, very uh, important coalition base in the electorate, um, you know, you can make a cartoon out of it and call it the 47%. I don't mean that economically. I mean, he's got 95% of the African-American vote, you know, 80% of the Democratic vote, 95% of the liberal vote, 75% of the Hispanic vote. That, that's a block of votes. That's an impressive, you know, you come to the election with a lot of electoral college uh, in your back pocket. And uh, so I, up until about the 20th of October, I believed uh, Romney would probably lose. And then I drank the Kool-Aid with everyone else. Um, I, I will tell you, when you when you hear folks from the Romney team, the inner team, say that they were shocked at the outcome, um, again, I was not anywhere near the percent of this group. I was you know, several electron rings uh, from the from the center of this. But we were we were shocked. We were shocked not only, I think we all recognized that we could lose, but we were shocked at the extent of the, the defeat. It was a, it was a spanking. And um, um, I, I remember it was a, <clears throat> the, the Monday before the election. I was at transition headquarters. I was um, going through some ethics interview and, and uh, sitting with a few friends, uh, colleagues that I had made along the way. And I, and, uh, I said to one of them, <laughs> Uh, I said, just remember, eight years ago, there were people sitting in these seats in the John Kerry campaign saying to themselves, there's no way the American people can possibly reelect this guy. Uh, and it's kind of, kind of what happened to us. Yeah. So, yeah, the expectations were high. I mean, we, I think when, when Romney says, and, and his his, um, his his assistants say that they were surprised. I think they legitimately were. And I think it boils down, I mean, it really boils down to their smart guys were smarter than our smart guys. And, and, and they got it done and we didn't. Right, in terms of in terms of getting out the boat and in terms of communications and so forth. Um, I mean, it, you know, it also seemed that, you know, just informing expectations that there were also widely divergent um, attitudes towards the extant data, right, that, that there was on, on polling and so forth. Yeah. Um, you know, again, in 2004, I won't say, maybe this is because I'm a normally dejected person <coughs> in regards to politics, I was not one of those people who was utterly confident that Kerry was going to win. But there were certainly people around me, um, and they were saying things like, well, you know, independent voters always break for the challenger, and, um, and you know, our get on vote operation is superior to the Bushes. Who, TV operation um, and so forth. And so I certainly think yeah, that there were echoes of those conversations um, 
eight years ago that played into those um, those much different interpretations of how it, how it played out. I just read it. I just read a. I guess it's a. His name is Dowd. Is Matthew Dowd wrote an article today, and you know he basically he said he said basically that he had been saying all along the only thing that makes a difference in this election is the president's approval rating. If the president's approval rating is over fifty percent, the president gets reelected. If it's under forty five percent, the president does not get reelected. On the day of the election, President Obama had a fifty one percent approval rating. Um, you know, I, I will tell you, I was I was one of those uh, conservative Republican druids, and I know you think those are all the same word, but um, uh, I, that that was I kept looking at the polls and I kept looking at the oversample uh, oversampling of Democrats in the polls, mm -hmm. and it just it just from a numbers driven guy, I, I was thinking to myself, well, the president's going to win, and uh, he he. He, he, you know, he either ties or wins the majority of these polls. It seemed you know, fairly straightforward. But then the, the bias uh, came in, and I, I reacted as negatively as many others did to the, the, the what, what I considered oversampling. Um, it seemed to me logical to think that the Republican turnout would be much like it was in 10, and that the Democrat turnout would be something less than it was in 2008. And um, um, uh, I don't think either of those things is correct. Actually, happened. I don't. I, I don't think the turnout was like it was in uh, 2010 for Republicans. And I think while there was some drop for the uh, Democrats, I think they still did pretty pretty darn well, like D plus six or D plus seven, something like that. Right. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. And I mean, there are two things to think about 2014. One is that. Um, uh, Second-term presidents normally get clobbered in the midterm elections, and this is this is the trend. And there are exceptions like '98, but then there are, uh, you know, like 2006, where it was just a massacre. Um, but the, but in general, second-term presidents tend to get clobbered. But we may also be looking at a reality with the electoral coalitions that the Democrats and Republicans have assembled, that in presidential years where turnout is higher. Um, Democrats have a decided advantage, and in midterm years where turnout is lower, Republicans have a decided advantage, right? And I'm not sure that sort of the coalition politics and the, the composition of the coalitions of Republicans and Democrats have varied as much in the past as they vary now, um, sort of producing outcomes where, you know, you, you consistently have a Democratic advantage in presidential years and you consistently have a Republican advantage. In, in midterm years. And I don't know if it'll play out that way, but it, it, it doesn't seem implausible that it'll play out that way. I mean, I would wager money that the Democrats, I would wager a ton of money that the Democrats will lose, certainly Senate seats in 2014, and I would, I would, I, I, I'm pretty sure they're going to lose uh, House seats as well, because um, I bet the election's going to, the electorate's going to look more like it did in 2010. Well, look, the coalition theory that you put forward, notwithstanding history, would suggest that those, no, that those declines would occur. Um, I, I think, but quite apart from that, I think your theories it's as good as anyone at this point. I mean, I, 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 um, I don't know, um, I, you know, there are a lot of Republicans right now that are saying, stay the course, they'll come back to us, you know, we, you know, it's like, no, they're not, they're not, I don't, I, I think there are some, um, issues that are tangential, of tangential importance. Um, to the governing philosophy of the Republican Party that we, we let we get stuck on and that then um, helps uh, generate the coalition on the other side that we can't seem to crack. And I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not the first to say it, but demography is against us. And um, uh, unless the, the Republican Party begins to think differently about these tangential issues, I think we're going to uh, be, be a minority party. Um, so, moving from the politics to the substance, I thought that um, Chris Cavas had just a fabulous interview with John Lehman during the campaign, where Lehman laid out, in just a lot of specifics, his vision, uh, the Secretary, former Secretary of the Navy, Lehman, um, a lot of specifics about what um, 
the Romney Navy, we call it the Romney Navy, but about what the United States Navy would look like in the beginning of a Romney administration. And there was a lot of interesting stuff there, you know, not just in terms of ship force sizing, where you had a you know, discussion about the 350, but also, you know, the proposal for a new frigate, the proposal for a new air wing. Um, I guess, what do you think that coming out of this election, how is the discourse over the Navy that we had in this election, how is it going to affect naval policy going forward? Um, I think the first thing to um, to to, uh, to understand is that the bunch that's there now um, uh, in the Department of Defense, um, I believe that they are, uh, and in the White House, the National Security Council, I believe they are navalists. I think they value naval power um, and, and sea power broadly. Um, I think they're obviously working under some pretty crushing financial constraints and restraints, uh, some of which are systemic and some of which are self-imposed. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, I mean, I wrote about this in 2009, I, I said something on information dissemination that um, the, the, this, this, wherever, whatever direction we go, the Navy is likely to uh, prosper uh, under this administration. And I still think that's the case. I think, um, I think the pivot to Asia uh, the, the, the sort of much ballyhooed discussion um, uh, will will continue to generate more of a sense uh, that a that the navy is important, b that sea power is important, and c that we need more of it. And um, I think the, the the one thing that the Romney campaign did well is to raise the issue. I. I I think that when we get our stuff together, and I think we eventually will get our stuff together as a country, um, the Navy will prosper, and I think the Navy will get bigger. I think it needs to get bigger. I think you can't possibly look at the, 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 the metric that makes a difference here is deployment lengths. The deployment lengths of our ships are getting longer and longer. We either have to uh, uh, shut down the demand, and uh, and we can then um, bring the deployment lengths back with a given force, or you can increase the size of the force, which would then give you enough ships to bring the average deployment length down. Um, but it's clear that the that the that the the demand for what naval forces do is increasing. It's not decreasing. And I think as we wind down from land wars in Asia, that that uh, demand signal is only going to go up. So I think the Obama administration, uh, as they try to work with the Congress and try to work their way through this, I, I would not be surprised if the Navy does not continue to grow. I mean, you look at their plan, their plan grows the Navy very slowly. Um, uh, you, you can, I think, question the numbers and you can question their commitment. Uh, but you can't question the plan. The plan shows the Navy growing, and, and I think that's a, probably a good thing. Um, so I'm curious, uh, sort of on this question of where the Obama administration is going in terms of naval policy, um, your assessment of the role of um, Lloyd Clinton, because Clinton, of course, um, you know, was the first to talk about the Asian pivot at uh, yeah, the beach. And she also, um, and I, I wrote a foreign policy article about this, she gave a talk at the uh, Naval Academy that sort of or suggested to me, and I'd be again interested in your interpretation of it, um, if you remember the speech, um, that she had a very deep understanding of the cooperative strategy. Um, uh, you know, that she really got what the cooperative strategy was. She was familiar with the main points of it. Um, and, you know, talked about it as a strong advocate for sort of specifically the cooperative strategy, not just maritime power in general. Um, but of course Hillary Clinton's leaving the administration, right? We don't know who's who's going to replace her. Um, but, you know, I, I, people are talking about, you know, so, you know, Don Kerry would be one thing, and, you know, he obviously has a naval history. Um, you know, Susan Rice would be entirely different. I don't really know where would she would be coming from. So I guess another way of phrasing this would be, do you think that a change in personnel is going to change this navalist orientation of the administration? No, I think it's, I think that um, in a, <coughs> Secretary Clinton's um, orientation, um, 
if I had to guess, I would say that her uh, assistant secretary for Asia Pacific Affairs, Kurt Campbell, I think Kurt has had a tremendous impact on her thinking. I think he's been very, very persuasive um, uh, in this regard. And so um, unless he leaves the administration, I think he'll continue to be persuasive and, and, and have impact. Um, the other thing is, is um, you know, I have, I have some uh, or had some tentacles into the National Security Council, some friends there, and uh, my sense is, is that um, <clears throat> National Security Advisor Donilon is a, uh, he's a navalist. Uh, I, I'm, I'm led to believe that in the uh, defense strategic guidance um, discussions that, that uh, the president was involved in, one of the very few red lines that he laid down was that he was not going to cut a carrier. Um, and so I, I think the administration uh, is, um, again, this is one part of the reason I think that naval forces will continue to do well uh, um, uh, proportionally uh, within the, the administration. So no, I don't think Secretary Clinton leaving is going to change that. I think her being there has been very helpful. She's, she's a, she, I, I, you know, she's a very effective Secretary of State. I, I don't think anyone can argue with that. So on this issue of proportion, you and I have argued in the past What's that? about uh, the issue of proportion, the proportion to the Navy, a proportion of the defense budget that the Navy gets. Um, you and I are, have argued in the past about, you know, the sort of uh, the concept which is which is very clumsily, I think, um, portrayed as four percent for freedom, right? But the sort of the larger ar ar argument being that you know that there, it makes good sense to um, establish a floor for defense spending, a GDP yeah. floor for defense spending. Yeah. Um, it's interesting um, in context of our conversation about what the future of the Navy looks like under Obama um, that if you assume a world in which you can have you know quasi-rational defense appropriation and you can shift money from ground forces to maritime forces um, that you maybe don't need a floor right because you can, you can take more money out of the ground um, however we live in the world and the world is thus and it happens that it's very difficult to take money out of um, one service and put it in another service in, in just how the United States does defense policy um, I mean I guess uh, what are your thoughts on that and what are your thoughts on that for how it matters for whether it makes sense to have this floor whether it's you know whether it's 3.5 percent or 3.2 percent or four percent or whatever you know whatever number you pick well there, there are several different issues there, and I'll kind of take them in turn. The first is whether I believe that um, the defense budget is, uh, you can divide it up and that you can alter its proportions. And I think the answer is yes. I think it takes time. It, it happens slowly. I think it's, um, if you say, I am going to downsize the Army in favor of upsizing the Navy, um, that's all fine in terms of political rhetoric, but what it actually means is that people lose jobs. Um, that, that you you either that either they either a, a, a trip or a trite I, I never know exactly what the word is for them. Um, they either leave the army and you don't replace them or you riff you send people home um, these are wrenching decisions they're difficult to make it's hard to you know, politically to take a, an, a, a, an army down fast um, but that's ultimately if your decision is that you're going to Grow your navy at the expense of your army. That's it takes some time. I think if you if you look at reputable um, divisions of the defense budget into Department of the Navy, Department of the Army, Department of the Air Force, other OSD, I think the Department of the Navy is probably growing in terms of share. Um, but I, I always refer to that as uh, in, the increase by proportional reduction. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, now, so I think that's possible. I think it's underway, actually. I think three years from now, we'll look back and the Navy will be three or four percent higher than it was, and the Army will be down somewhat. Um, as for the, the floor, um, the, the, the uh, four percent or whatever number you choose, I, I, you know, it, it, it comes again. This is the classic sort of what what is it that sizes your military? Is it is it the threats or is it your interests? Now, obviously, 
rational and sane people would say, well, it's, it's both. Um, but I think, generally speaking, force structure people, or at least policy people, come down on one side or the other on this issue. And I come down on the, it's your interests that sizes your military. Um, you know, there are, there are others, uh, you know, that I guess the, the, the two power standard, I guess the British Navy had at some point. Um, Frank, my, the esteemed Frank Huffman of uh, the National Defense University, um, he, he talks about a, you, you add what the next two are spending, um, uh, and then, and I don't know, then you put $100 billion on top of it. I don't know what it is, but it, it, it still is only like $450 billion a year is what he, he comes up with. Um, I, my, <clears throat> I find that unsatisfying. I find, t to me, that uh, it, it, is, it makes more sense logically to size your force based on what it is you need it to do around the world, the things that, that it does, some of which are war fighting, and those, and those requirements flow from primarily a statement of, or an assessment of capability and intent. On the other side, and I get that. But then there is the steady state steaming. There's the international diplomacy. There's the there is the uh, there is the imposing your will in peacetime part of this equation, uh, and protecting your interests. That that is not you can't you know identify in a war plan. Uh, you can't um, you know say this war plan calls for this many carriers or whatever. It requires uh, a, a, I think a, a more nuanced approach. And it, one of the ways that I've found unsatisfying, but certainly more satisfying than giving up, is using a, a cutout uh, for our interests, and that cutout is our economy, our, our gross domestic product. And so if you arrive at some reasonable assessment at what would be the minimal uh, the, the minimal share, I mean, I, I, I find it interesting that some people are, 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 are um, they have no problem with assessing a fair share of some people for taxes, yet they, have, they, they can't get their mind around the possibility of what share of our national wealth should we devote to protecting and extending that wealth. Um, so I, it, it's always, I, I've always come down on this, whether it's three, three and a half, four, I don't know what that number is, but I would like there as a communications point I think I referred to this in our, in our back and forth as a communication strategy where, in which the, the, the president says to his OMB, to his OSD, to the Republicans on the Hill, the Democrats on the Hill, whoever, this is it. This is my floor. You know, bam, that's it. You may, you, I think you can make um, principled objections to whether that is strategic in terms of um, grand strategy in the, in the, uh, in the, um, Corbettian sense or whatever, but, uh, but in terms of uh, getting things done in Washington and, and devoting resources, mat matching ends, ways, and means, uh, I think it's a reasonable approach. It's definitely a domestic political strategy. Now, I mean, and we've had this back and forth, and so I won't go too much into it. I mean, I, I, as you know, I tend to you know, concentrate on the threat aspect. Um, yeah, I and mean, I, I, I do find a world in which, you know, we not, not only have the largest economy in the world, but we also spend, among at least the major powers, we spend the highest percentage of our GDP. I find that world problematic. But um, I do have to say, in your defense, that there is a not implausible argument that um, if the United States did not spend 3.7% of its, uh, or 4.4, or whatever it happens to be right now, um, of its uh, economy on defense, um, then you might see countries like India and China and Russia spending more than they do right now, right? That, that's simply, and especially in context of naval power, that naval hegemony is hegemony, that, that it keeps a lid on everything else and it makes con conflict less likely. Um, it's interesting too, though, that um, sort of your assessment of threat also plays into force structure, it plays into what kind of ships you buy. Yeah, absolutely. More than just, it plays into how, you know, if you view the world as extremely threatening, then you maybe you devote your resources more towards um, high-intensity warfare platforms like nuclear attack submarines or something like that, where you view it as less threatening and more maintenance-oriented, then you look at the possibility of a high-endurance um, frigate that can go all over the world and do um, 
a variety of different sea maintenance missions. Um, no, it, it does, I mean, I think, um, I think your your interests drive the minimum you spend. The threat drives what gets added on top of that, um, and and the, and the threat then. Um, nuances the platforms and says we will we will bias ourselves towards this or we will bias our, bias ourselves towards that. Um, uh, I, I, I absolutely believe the threat helps drive those kinds of things. Um, um, there was one other thing I want. I'll, I'll probably get to it when, when we, I'm, I'm, I'm missing something right now. But. Well, hold, I mean, if that comes back into your brain, feel free to interrupt. Thank you. Um, yep. Before before we are finished, I wanted you know there happens to be a thing going on right now um, in the Middle East. I'm not sure if you're aware or familiar with the Middle East, but uh, you know apparently there's something going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And without, because I find, I find debates over Israeli-Palestinian issues almost almost uniformly uninteresting and um, un, you know, lacking in utility. But there is. Um, I do find operational questions very interesting, um, and right now the big thing is uh, that the um, operational status of Iron Dome, the Israeli anti-rocket system, yeah. um, which some people are arguing has been very successful in regards to shooting down uh, a significant number of rockets launched by Palestinians. Yeah. Um, now, you may have seen um, the op-ed that Max Boot uh, wrote yesterday in commentary, not that important either way. Um, but, but, well, I, mean, I guess it is important in, insofar as that Max Boot very explicitly connects Iron Dome with national missile defense and with Ronald Reagan, um, which I found appalling for a variety of reasons. But, I mean, I guess, what do you think about, you know, insofar as um, I'm paying attention, what do you think about what's going on with Iron Dome right now and how does this experience matter for the American experience of missile defense? Um, I, I think um, I think the jury's out. I, I think it, 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 we have some experience in an analog here, and that is the performance of Patriot in uh, uh, the first Gulf War. Um, there was a lot of talk and a lot of, of uh, uh, backslapping and a lot of um, you know we had these, this film of Patriot intercepts, um, and then there was the data. And the data reduction uh, indicated that there was some success, but perhaps it wasn't as successful as uh, as it had been trumpeted. I don't know that the U.S. Army was trumpeting it or Central Command or anyone anyone responsible was, but there was a lot of uh, people were very high on the system, and I, and I think the data remains to be to be reduced on, on Iron Dome. It seems to have some capability and to be somewhat to have some success. The question is, how successful? Um, are the ones that are getting by, getting by because they were headed somewhere that was unimportant, or are they getting by because of, it wasn't a, a successful engagement? I don't know yet. Um, but I, I think um, I saw, uh, I don't know, I saw some Twitter, um, I think some, some other people who I think were as, as appalled as you were uh, by uh, Max Boots' um, article. I didn't read it. Um, but if you said to me, as a matter of logic and as a matter of technology, um, that the investments uh, in uh, uh, the artist formerly known as Strategic Defense Initiative moving its way into um, uh, Star Wars and, and into whatever it is called today, um, that those investments and that, that sort of unbroken chain of of seeing this mission area as important, as understanding battle management, as understanding the physics of engagement and the, and, and the, um, the discussion of um, appropriate interceptors for, appro for incoming targets, I think you can't possibly separate that, uh, the, 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 where Iron Dome is today from that larger discussion. Uh, I, 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 again, I don't think I would make a you know, a, a lockstep connection, uh, but the the the, the, the a lot of the engineering principles are, are similar. A lot of the people working on it are similar. The missile defense. Right. It's Raytheon, right? Is Raytheon is the. Is I'm the, not sure. Uh, when I when I think, think about the people, I think about uh, the missile defense agency, who has had a you know a 20, 20 year relationship with uh, Israeli defense 
you know, the forces and, and, and you know, they're working this problem, this problem, uh, you know, a ballistic missile, these things are ballistic missiles, they're just very short range ballistic missiles. Um, and one of the things I always tell people in the, you know, it, 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 well, that's not, but the, 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 the thinking, the organization, the resources, the, there are echoes of that in Iron Dome. There are echoes of, of uh, national missile defense in Iron Dome. There are echoes. They're not, again, it's not the same thing. Uh, but I, I think you can't completely dismiss it, nor I think is it probably appropriate to say, see, you know, look what this did. I think they're related, and you have to respect the relations, both their extent uh, and the, uh, how they might be misused. One of the things that is interesting to me with regards to this discussion of, and I, and I don't think we're quite going to have something, have a replay of the, of the 1991 Patriot uh, situation, because, you know, it was actually, I mean, it was, it, it became readily apparent that there was some problem when we were declaring successful intercepts and yet the war had would fall right in the middle of our, of our personnel, right? right? And so, what, I don't know if it concerns me, it interests me about this is the fact that for successful intercepts with Iron Dome, the Israelis seem to be paying a much higher rate, a much higher, higher marginal cost, and they seem willing to pay a much higher marginal cost. And maybe they should be because Israel is a much wealthier society than, than Gaza. Um, but they are paying a much higher marginal cost for every rocket that's intercepted. And what I am wondering, you know, and as I, I think I tweeted today, Palestinians can use Excel just like anybody else can. Um, and what I am wondering is, you know, whether somebody's going to come with the idea that you know, it really doesn't matter whether these rockets hit anything, as long as the Israelis fire something to intercept them, right? Because you know those rockets that the Israelis are firing, those missiles that the Israelis are firing, projectiles that the Israelis are firing, are somewhere between forty and a hundred thousand um, dollars. And you know, at what point does somebody in Palestine say? You know, who cares whether we kill an Israeli because we, we kill very few of them with rockets anyway, something like five in the last five years. Um, but simply creating creating a belief on the Israeli public that the Israeli the, the IDF needs to protect it from rockets and then sort of forcing the Israelis to respond to these kinds of rocket attacks, whether that doesn't in the end play out in a way that's that's not favorable. Um, to Israel, even though they have this technical capability. Well, I guess for me, the essential um, part of this discussion is if all Israel were doing was sitting back and intercepting uh, four out of five or three out of five of these rockets, um, then I th then I would be I think I would find myself very sympathetic to your point. But it's not all they're doing. They're going out. They're schwacking targets. They're going after uh, individuals. They're going after weapons caches. They're. Uh, they're this is this appears to be a fairly well out, well thought out campaign. I mean, you get. I think at the start there was like five five launches, and then all of a sudden this, the Israelis took out seventy targets in one hour. It seems to me that they've been considering this and thinking about this before they before they did it. So I, I guess I would say. Because this appears to be part of a larger campaign, the spreadsheet, the spreadsheet theory uh, probably is less important than if they were trying to, if this was all they were doing. Um, but I, I think it's, it's important. I mean, it's, it's a cost-imposing strategy, right? I mean, it's, it, you know, we have, we have, we're on the same bad side of the curve with the Chinese with, <laughs> with, with our, the cost of our interceptors versus the cost of their they're ballistic missiles, um, and they get a lot more of them than we do. So, tough problem. All right. Well, um, yeah, I think this has been a fabulous conversation, um, and I hope that the audience has enjoyed it. Do you have anything else to say before we roll? No, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, and and uh, happy Thanksgiving to you and your family in Kentucky, and uh, I look forward to the next time we do this. All right, and happy Thanksgiving uh, to our, our viewers around the world, even if your country doesn't celebrate Thanksgiving. So, um, <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Brian. Take care.